Amen. Praise God. Blessed is you who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch Hamad Hashem Adonai. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Colin. Colin will tell you a bit more about himself as well. Colin, you have more time. Welcome. God bless you. You live in a cold country. <laughs> and I have a cold one. Oh. I have a cold one. Yeah. <laughs> no sympathy for the Brits. <laughs> you all get them every week, I know. Um, <laughs> and the funny thing about doing, and uh, you know, I'm a man that likes to laugh, and I'm going to be talking about very painful things. I just want to say to you, all of you, thank you for being here. Each and every one of you. And also, I want to say, when it comes to Q&As, uh, I reserve the right with three little words to answer, I don't know. However, um, I want you to feel free to ask anything, including, you know, questions about what you're seeing, pumped to you by the BBC, <coughs> by Sky News, by the Western media, and I, I will try to answer. I've been here a week. I was appalled by something I saw on BBC News the other evening, and I made a note of it to give you an example. But, but at the same time, you know, there are difficult things happening. People are suffering and dying in Gaza. I don't want to get away from it. Um, uh, you know, so I want you to be free to ask difficult questions, and I will endeavour to respond. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been here a week, but my wife and children, Helen, Yaakov, and Hannah, our adopted children, <coughs> who by birth are both Jewish and Arab, I'll show you a picture of that, um, have been here longer. Yaakov has uh, a degree of autism. And special needs, and, and he suffers with anxiety, and sirens and rockets are not good for him to be around. Um, and it's also not good for my daughter Hannah, who uh, doesn't have any of that, but still, it's a very uh, worrying time. Um, and so my family are currently evacuated to England, and are with my wife's parents, which is where you know I'm staying. And it's Really, in terms of ministry on this little trip, this is a weekend here, so I'm speaking here tomorrow morning, um, and I'll preach tomorrow morning, I and mean, I'll share God's word in more detail later tomorrow. Um, and then one evening meeting midweek, and that's it, because I'm actually here to spend time with my wife and children. For one night, I'm not sleeping in the same home with them. Um, and I wanted to mention that first. Because what you're experiencing, when you look at the news and you hear what is going on, it's kind of impersonal. And I want you to understand how personal it is. And the only way to do that is to tell you some stories, to show you some painful things, to speak reality, and ask you to think and pray. Preferably to pray, but also to consider everything I share with you in the light of everything else you're seeing, a lot of which is so unbalanced is the word I would use. So, um, so in a minute we're going to do a PowerPoint and I'm going to show you some images. Um, my family, therefore, Helen is, is not Jewish, she's Gentile, I call her my English Rose. You're supposed to go, ah. <laughs> Come on, relax. Relax. Mother's Day tomorrow, come on. And I left my Mother's Day present that the children apparently bought uh, for Helen. It's at home, I didn't forget, so it's all good. Uh, and um, just a couple of other things. Our congregation on Mount, so Helen's not Jewish, I'm Jewish. I grew up in a semi-religious Jewish family in, London, in East London, that day, <coughs> where you have a cup of tea and, you know, Everything gets sorted. <coughs> I was surrounded by people like that. But, but my Jewish dad wanted me to speak properly, not just me, me and my brothers. And um, so I went to Jewish schools. I was born at the age of 13. I knew about anti-Semitism from a very young age. 
We were not allowed to go home from school on our own because of the neighboring schools, the Church of England school, where the kids would spit on us and attack us and call us Christ killers, Church of England. And of course, they're not very Christian to be honest, but you try telling that to Jewish kids who are being spat on. That was when I was a boy growing up in post-war England. My father served in the Royal Air Force. He was proud to fly in Lancaster bombers during World War II. And I don't think my family could fully comprehend what was happening in post-war Britain in terms of hatred of Jewish people, which has only grown and is now at the worst levels. So that you know in your own newspapers, they're saying London, where I grew up, the east side of London, London is not safe for Jewish people, especially at weekends. With all the hate and the filth that is happening there. And I do certainly defend people's right to protest, but there are things that they are doing and things that they are saying, which is basically agreeing with the slaughter of Jewish people. And I'll explain it. You know, and we can ask, we can ask questions about it. So our congregation on the top of Mount Carmel is Jewish people and Arab people worshipping the Lord together. You don't hear that on the BBC. <laughs> and of course, Yaakov and Hannah, who we adopted, who are by birth both Jewish and Arab, and they know it, by the way, um, uh, are like a symbol of our congregation. We call ourselves a one new man congregation. Ephesians 2.15, God has made one new man in Christ, one new man in Messiah, removing what? The hatred. And I believe that's the only peace process that can work. I mean, we should pray for politicians. My goodness, we should pray for politicians. What a mess. All over the world. I mean, look at America. Then look at England. Then look at Europe. And actually, you can look at Israel too, because our politics is in a mess as well, and I'll explain that. You can ask about that too. Um, a one new man congregation of Jews, Arabs, and others bouncing around on the top of biblical Mount Carmel, where Elijah confronted the false prophets of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18. That's where we are worshipping the Lord. And he is coming. And we're seeing Jews and Arabs, even Druze. The village, our congregational worship centre is in that Suzanne has served with us so faithfully and so touchy here. Um, the Druze are one of the most unreached people groups for the gospel, and we've had Druze coming into our congregation and getting saved. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, so I say all of that because I want to give you a context that we're a congregation who prays for the Jewish people, but we pray for the Arab people. There is no hatred in the kingdom of God. Racism in any form is not acceptable in the kingdom of God. I've had people even here in England come up to me when I've been doing meetings, saying, oh, we love the Jews, and we hate the Arabs. And then there are Christians who love the Arabs and hate the Jews. My dear, uh, how can you love Jesus, who is Jewish, and hate the Jews? That doesn't make any sense. In fact, there was a great philosopher who said, how odd of God to choose the Jews, but odder still, it's Leo Rossi, odder still are those who worship the Jewish God and hate the Jews. And there are churches like that, dotted around even here in the UK and in other parts of the world. We're here basically tonight, I'm here for you. I'm here to listen. I'm here to try and respond, to listen to each other on a very hot and distressing subject. I am going to say difficult things. I, I want to say it as a must. I'm glad there are no children here. Uh, because even Helen and I can't talk in front of our own children. If the word hostage is met, it's said at any time, you can see our kids tense up. So we just try and avoid it. Even. <laughs> Poor Helen, Helen's parents, my in-laws, can't watch the news if the children are up and about. Only when they've got a bed, that's when the news can be watched. Or they're out, then they can watch the news. So it's a really painful time. And it's a really traumatised time. I want to say, in all honesty, Israel is a traumatised nation. 
We've carried so much in our history <coughs> of, of dreadful things, of slaughter, of the Holocaust, of way before that, a whole, a whole host of things. And we're, we're going through it again. And um, we are traumatized as a nation. Our believing community is traumatized. My kids, my wife, I am. I'll explain that in a while. You can ask more as well. So, just want to give you some brief history because some people think that the trouble started on October the 7th when Hamas committed the most abominable things. I'm going to show you some images because I've been there. I've been there. But before we get there, I just want to share this with you. Back on the 12th of September 2005, so 19 years ago, Israel withdrew all of the Jewish people from Gaza. Yet I still hear the BBC and Sky News and others saying it's occupied. Occupied by who? There aren't any Jewish people in Gaza. All the Jewish communities were pulled out from Gaza, painfully, on the 12th of September 2005, unilaterally, there was no kind of agreement other than Israel wanted to show that it was serious about peace. So they pulled out 2005. In January of 2006, there were elections in Gaza. I'm not sure how fair they were, although international observers said they were. And Gazans voted for Hamas. Do not believe that all the population of Gaza are innocent. Indeed, on October the 7th, it wasn't just terrorists who poured into Israel, it was people, the population, who came with them. <sighs> it is a hard thing to say. So they had the elections in January 2006, then they had a civil war between Hamas and Fatah. Fatah is, uh, was under the leadership of Yasser Arafat, you remember him. Uh, and then, of course, now it's Abbas, Mahmoud Abbas. So Fatah controls what is called by the world the West Bank, which is basically Judea and Samaria. And Hamas and Fatah, Palestinians as they would identify themselves, butchered each other. In what is called, you can Google this and read about it, on the 10th to the 15th of June, 2007, so 17 years ago, just less than, Fatah and Hamas had a civil war, during which 161 people died, including 120 terrorists on both sides. They're both terrorist organizations, absolutely committed to the destruction of Israel, but they fought each other. 39 innocent civilians were killed in that civil war. Nobody complained much about it that I remember, about loss of civilian life, not then, anyway. And actually, two UNRWA workers, UNRWA, the UN agency that uh, basically pours money to the Palestinians. After October 7th, you notice a lot of nations, including Great Britain, withdrew their funding from UNRWA because Israel's identified over a hundred members of staff were with Hamas fighting and going into Israel on the 7th of October. They were not um, uh, agency workers, they're terrorists. By the way, Canada and Sweden have announced they're restoring their funding. So, and nothing, it's like, oh, it's just a little, it's a little thing. It's not a little thing. It's a huge thing. A UN agency employing terrorists who committed murder. Think about that. And then when you ever hear the news again and they say, and the UN said, maybe you won't give so much value to what the UN says. Just think about it. That's what I want you to do. So that was in the Battle, what is called the Battle of Gaza, 2007. And the world knew all about it. They knew all about it. Iran started sending money and arms to Hamas. By the way, and then in 20, 
And then after that civil war, Hamas formed a government and killed, kicked out anyone who was um, representing Fatah. Um, a couple of other things. It's not just Iran who funds Hamas. Turkey, today President Erdogan, the leader of Turkey, said he stands with Hamas. He stands with Hamas. Israel's a genocidal nation. He completely ignores what happened on October the 7th. That's Turkey. Qatar, where the last World Cup was played. Notice when you, any of you watch Sky News? Who, who sponsors the weather for Sky News? Qatar Airways. Do you think Sky News and their journalists might be influenced by the fact? And you can go online and you can't find how many, how much money Qatar are financing Sky News. You can't find that information. And Qatar is funding Hamas. That's why they're in the negotiations, so-called negotiations, for free the release of the remaining hostages. And we'll come back to hostages in a while, but in October 2007, 17 years ago, under 17 years ago, um, there was a Christian Bible bookstore in Gaza. And the uh, man who was running it, an evangelical Arab Christian called Rami Ayad, was murdered by Hamas. So we raised much alarm in the world about that. And all the Christians fled from Gaza, and most of them ended up in the so-called West Bank, including Rami Ayad's wife and his children had to leave. He was murdered. The bookshop was destroyed and closed. That's what freedom of religion is under radical Islam. We're forgetting who radical Islam is, and I'm not preaching hatred towards Arab people, because I, my kids are, by birth, both Arab and Jewish. You've got to hear my heart on this. The most wonderful believers I've had the privilege to meet around the world are Muslim background believers who come to faith and go from hating the Jewish people to loving the Jewish people. It's a remarkable reality. After 2007, by the way, in that six-day war in June 1967, when Israel liberated Jerusalem from Jordanian control, Gaza, up until 1967, was under Egypt. And they gave them no electricity, they gave them no running water, no wonder Egypt doesn't want any Gazans fleeing from the southern border into Egypt. Have you noticed that? They put a huge wall up. So we, we don't want any Gazans coming in from Rafa. So before 1967, Gaza was under Egypt. It was Israel that put the water into Gaza, that put the electricity into Gaza. And by the way, when they were installing it, they were being shot at. But they still did it. And since 2007, this is important, tens of thousands of rockets have been fired by Hamas into Israel. And I've been down to those southern communities like Sterot and, uh, before, and um, the kids were traumatized, always having to run to the bomb shelters, rockets coming indiscriminately, hitting kindergartens, hitting schools, they didn't care who they were firing at. And by the way, when this one was like, okay, we need to get those people who are firing the rockets, they find children, Palestinian children, being placed strategically where they're firing the rockets from as human shields to deter Israel because they know that Israel will try desperately to avoid, especially children and women, being hurt. Now that doesn't mean they don't get hurt, but what do you do? Now I want you to imagine something. And I'm sorry I'm getting strong on this, but it, it's painful. I want you to imagine the people you love, your children, your families, your communities. And just for a minute, imagine that somebody is firing rockets at them into your back garden, into your workplaces, into the schools, the universities, into everywhere and to the people that you love the most, putting them at great risk and traumatizing them. 
What would you ask your government to do? Nothing? Of course not. You would expect a response. You would say, we've got to stop this. Well, Israel, basically, apart from reciprocating when they were being fired at, and desperately trying not to hurt civilians for 17 years. And so we come up to date with this idea that tens of thousands of rockets have been fired for years before we get to the 7th of October last year. And now we get, oh, just before we go there, just before, Jared, before you move to the next slide, I want to read something and tell you something. On the 7th of October, well, Helen and the children and I had been on holiday in Cyprus. We were, we were blessed to go and we had an amazing time. It was, the, it was Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles during the week. And so we were there for about three days. I left our car at the airport in Tel Aviv. And um, we, we flew to Cyprus, had a wonderful time, and uh, we flew back and landed at 7 o'clock in the morning on the 7th of October in Tel Aviv. Yaakov, Yaakov will be 10 in August, he's 9, I told you he has special needs. Hannah is 8 going on 18. And, um, we got off the plane and I'm, thinking, I'm not like accessing the internet straight away. I had it on the phone, I didn't access it. Things were taking time, it took time to get to the, to the terminal, it took time to get our baggage. Uh, and then we get a little shuttle to take us to the car park where our car is parked. And the shuttle stops under a bridge. And I'm thinking, nobody's saying, what's going on? Why, what are we stopped for? And then I accessed the internet to see, and we landed at 7, but from 6.30, the terrorists, Hamas, has poured into Israel and they're committing butchery. We knew it straight away. Somehow, the IDF did not arrive for seven hours down the south. It was Simchat Torah, it was a Jewish holiday. It's a little bit like history, if you've seen the film Golda, where the Syrians and the Egyptians attacked Israel on Yom Kippur because they knew the Jews would be celebrating and in their synagogues and not really 100% ready to do war. And I'm afraid what happened on the 7th was the same thing. That they thought, okay, we'll do it on a holiday where people don't even, oh, don't be silly, no one's coming. What do you mean they're coming through the border fence? It can't be real. Can't be true. There was a denial going on. Um, so we landed. Eventually the shuffle goes to the car park, and as I'm loading the car, we're all outside the car, the children, Helen, myself, sirens. As I can assure you that it jars you right in the, in the pit of the stomach. And then rockets. And then Iron Dome, it's not shooting them down. They're defensive, Iron Dome. They're just there to shoot down the rockets that the terrorists fire at us. So they shoot them down, the kids are like, oh, Yako's eyes are popping out. I never drove so fast as when the siren fit. I said, you know, normally you're supposed to lie on the floor, you don't get in the car. I couldn't do that to them. I just said, get in the car. Let's just get in the car. We sat down, waited for a siren all clear, and then we drove out of the airport complex and there's smoke and fire. You can see south, loads of fire, loads of smoke. Sirens, you can hear in the distance as well. I never drove so fast because we live in the north. Gaza's in the south. Mount Carmel is in the north. So we drove, get home. Of course, Helen and I now are looking at the news. It's coming in all the time. Eventually, the kids go to bed, and then Helen goes to bed. And I can't move. I'm sat in an armchair. I can't move because the stories are coming in of rape. It's Women's Day, it's that's a Women's Day, isn't it? And the organizations are trying to silence the Jewish women who are talking about how Hamas weaponized sexual assault and rape during the atrocity. It's worse than that. I'm going to say things that are painful. Please forgive me for doing this. 
but we need to know the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And I'm so grateful that I'm here and I see images and things that make me remember what matters most. We need that. But we also need to stand for the truth. We need to know the truth. Right? They were raping women and then shooting them in the groin and murdering them and cutting them. They put babies and mothers together and they were sinned and burnt together in their homes. But I'll tell you other things that are there. But what was happening? And I couldn't move. I was in such a state of shock. I just sat there groaning. And basically we've been in shock ever since. That we're trying to adjust them. So I want to read the first verse that came to my mind. And I'll just read it to you. Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 1 um, says this. Over my head were waters, and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I may, might weep day and night for the slaying of the daughter of my people. That's Jeremiah 9 1. The first chronicle, second chronicle 7 14, we all know, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then the Lord says, I will hear their prayers and heal their land. Our land, Israel needs healing. I have to say, so does the UK. And so does so many other, the America, what the state of America is. There's a lot of need, a dreadful, overwhelming need for healing, and we're devastated. Then we've watched the nations, and we've watched how the politicians have responded. Now, I'm just going to read this, and then as we go through the PowerPoint, I will say more. Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage, and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth, the presidents, the prime ministers, the European Union, the United Nations, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. <coughs> And it goes on to say, and I love this, because I think it's an advice for politicians and for prime ministers and for leaders around the world. Verses 10 and 11. Now therefore, be wise, O kings. Be wise, President Biden. Be wise, Rishi Sunak, David Cameron. So arrogant, I have to tell you. Be wise. Heads of the United Nations, Guterres, who is trying to cover up the truth. Be wise. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun. How about that? Lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those, that's us. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Let's remember. Let's remember him. And then I just am very challenging now. This will make you think. Let's go to the New Testament and I'll read you this. It's part of the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. It's one that features in my book. I forgot to mention my book, The Spirit of Adoption, is there on the table. The books cost 15 pounds. There's a lot of beautiful photographs, including of my wife, my children when they were babies, and other things. Go into details. One of the chapters is from these verses. Matthew 5, verse 43 onwards. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. 
Those are not my words. They're the words of our Lord. Love your enemies. And as I often say to people in churches, your enemies are not the people who you meet on a Sunday morning in church. You go, hello, hi, how you doing? Okay. And inside you're going, please don't let them sit next to me. They absolutely drive me crazy. And also, if I share anything personal, the whole community will know about it in five minutes. Those are not the people who are your enemies. They're the people God sent to improve your character. <laughs> in this way, when, when we hear sirens and rockets are being fired, bang! And we had one bang outside our window at 3.45 in the morning, which woke us all up. And the kids were saying, what's that, what's that? And I said, well, hello, I like, like, like trying to calm it. I just said, oh, it's probably because we've had a lot of thunderstorms. It was probably a storm, but we knew it wasn't. It was Iron Dome shooting down a rocket above us, because they do reach us. And anyway, they're firing from Lebanon, but not many have reached where we are at the minute, our neighborhood, put it that way. But it's scary enough. Our enemies are people who want to murder you, who want to kill you. And they did in great big numbers. All right. I've given you a lot of background. Now we go to the slide. Let's move to the next slide, Jared, thanks. Yes, so just, I'm trying to think now. I've been here a week, it's about three and a half weeks ago. I was with 70 international pastors. I was the only local leader, local pastor, present uh, with the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem and we were given access to three different kibbutz communities on the Gaza border. I knew that if I was going to ever talk about any of this, as I'm doing this evening, I needed to see it for myself. And it was very, very painful. I've done videos about it. You can go on YouTube and see clear news from Mount Carmel. And I did two videos while I was in kibbutz near, near Oz which is right on the Gaza border. They were surrounded by 300 terrorists, armed, coming in with slaughter and murder on their, that was all they were thinking about. And um, kibbutz near us, one in four people, either slaughtered, murdered, or abducted, hostages. In fact, there's a picture I haven't got on this slide of a locker room, which had the lockers because it's a community, you see. So they have a community dining room, completely destroyed, bullet holes everywhere, smashed to smithereens. And they had a locker room for every family on the kibbutz. And they put stickers on them. Red means dead. That was the majority. Blue means, um, uh, there was another one that was, oh, oh, I know, red, red was dead, black was hostages, blue was, they were hostages and one, one or two of them got released in the first release that took place before Hamas broke the ceasefire. These world leaders calling for ceasefire, Hamas has already broken that. Time after time after time. Do they really believe that people who commit murder, who burn babies, who rape people and shoot them, are people who will tell the truth? You ask that question. If, if you knew somebody like that and had that as their background information, would you trust them to tell you the truth? Of course you wouldn't. So what's Biden talking about? What's Cameron talking about? What are they on about? Of course you can't trust them. Whew, kibbutz near us, so close to the Gaza border that the fence there's a, had a gate on one side that I stood at, and you just open the gate and you can walk straight to Gaza. It's that close. And the saddest, most awful thing is that the people is the Jewish people who are living in those people too, and also international people like many Thai workers, people from Thailand, who were also butchered in great numbers, um, were peace-loving people, liberal people. 
people who are actually helping their Gaza neighbors for their children. If, if one of the big families from Gaza came and said, oh, my child is so sick, needs hospital treatment, they would arrange for the child and the family to come into Israel and get the treatment in an Israeli hospital. They were having coffee with them. They were eating meals with them. They were befriending them. They're peace-loving people. And it is clear, and they found evidence of this, that Hamas were able to work out where everybody, which every family living on the kibbutzim, because the people who were being helped were giving them information and helping them to map the kibbutz because it's a very kind of ramshackle thing where people you, you don't know, you would never know where people live. They knew, they had the advanced intelligence because the people in the kibbutz who were helping those Arabs in Gaza were actually being betrayed. The ultimate betrayal. Whew. Okay, let's go to the next one. Next slide, Derek. Yeah. Oh, burnt out buildings. I've talked about the betrayal. I've never seen anything quite like this. I, I have, I'm not showing you the worst ones. I went into some houses, you know. They were burnt. I mean, they cindered everything. Babies were burnt in their carts. Who does that? What kind of person can do that? No one can live there until they demolish the buildings and rebuild them. But I tell you, uh, they have to leave them for a while because people don't realize what happened. And I'm trying to share it with you. Okay, next, next slide, Derek. Yeah. Looks kind of innocent, doesn't it? Perhaps the most famous of all the hostages that people around the world have taken note of of the Bieber's family. I had a child who was less than one, age, a toddler less than one year old, a four year old, two boys, mum and dad, young parents, all kidnapped from their home in kibbutz near Oz, all taken, nobody knows if they're alive. Hamas won't tell the world the names of the hostages that they still have because they, I suspect quite a number of them are not alive anymore. And others who are alive are going to tell of the rape and the torture they're going to, they would have been through as hostages. You're not hearing anything. When you're hearing all this pressure being applied on Israel, Israel, you mustn't do this. You must do this. No, you, you, you're not getting enough aid in. They're getting shot at when they put aid in. I mean, it's mad to think like that. And they know the truth. Biden knows the truth, but he's got to appeal to his left-wing people in his party, and he's got to appeal to the Arab Muslim voters in the United States. And Mr. Starmer, whose wife is Jewish and was born in Tel Aviv, if you didn't know, um, he was standing with Israel at the beginning, had no ceasefire, and of course, you know, Muslims in the Labour Party all resigning and everybody abusing. Um, so that even Angela Rayner, his deputy, who is a left-wing extremist who hates Israel, is afraid of the Palestinians that she would support because they're angry with the Labour Party. So then he decides to call for a ceasefire. Ceasefire for what? So to allow Hamas to stay and do it all over again? They have said publicly, we want to do this again and again and again. Nobody accused Britain when we were eradicating the Nazis in World War II and had to do it and it was painful and awful and the, the pressure on Israel not to defend itself is, is unrelenting. This is the climbing frame of the children outside their home. I stood there and looked at the climbing frame of those two children. And the only other thing that was there, and I did a video called Only the Flowers Remain, which has gone around the world. And that's the only other thing that was there, was the flowers. I was choked. Now listen, we do pray for our people. We don't want any innocent person to be hurt. But I, this video went around the world, and of course people then forwarded it to their contacts. 
And then I got a message back saying, this is what some woman in England said, a Christian woman who said, I would have liked to have seen you pray for the Arabs in the video. And I thought, come on, we're doing this all the time. And anyone who knows our congregation knows our heart and our love for the Arab people. And I have children who are by birth both Jewish and Arab, and I cannot only love half of them. It's just a nonsense. But I was choked and the insensitivity of somebody sitting comfortably somewhere in England saying, oh, you should have done this. I sent a message back saying, maybe you could be a bit more sensitive. Maybe you could have a little bit better understanding. And that was from a Christian woman who loves the Lord. Who knows whether the children and the family will return back? And is the world talking about them? anymore? Has anybody remembered them? Does Biden, when he's doing his stuff, and, and, and Cameron doing his stuff, you must do this, you need to cease fire immediately. Are they remembering these people? Let's go to the next slide, Gareth. We're going to have a bit of time. Okay, fine. We're doing great. We're going to have plenty of time for questions. Oh, God. A thousand plus cars. Oh, good cars. Huh? Hamas, when they came in and they came in on trucks and jeeps and what have you, started just mowing down people in their cars as they were driving along on that Shabbat morning, Saturday morning. And I, there I am in the pastors, just looking. They brought them all together in a field. Israel is still doing DNA testing on the inside of the vehicles to try and work out who was in them. They don't know all the people that died. Let's move to the next slide. I'll tell you a story. Here's another. I'm going to tell you here. We, we met people while we were there. We met a mother who had hollow eyes and couldn't speak and her daughter was murdered on the 7th of October by Hamas. Does any other politicians remember her? <laughs> and then there was this guy, an old guy, an old security guy in the south. He was woken early in the morning on that day and, and heard something was going and he gets in his car and he goes, heads down, he's heading south on one of the main roads past the kibbutz where his family are living and um, they survived by the way and others did and <clears throat> as he gets to a roundabout he looks across the other side of the roundabout and he sees Hamas terrorists with machine guns on the other side heading up north towards him he's got a, he knows he had 30 cars behind him he immediately you turn and says, everybody turn around, please turn around. I'll get you safe. Because he was local, he knew the whole area. And because some people were going south because they were on holiday. What a way to spend the holiday. They did a U-turn and 18 cars followed him. And he knows the numbers because of what happened. So 18 cars followed him. He didn't drive on the road, he drove across fields because he knew where they could go that would get safe away from the terrorists. And they all survived. But 12 cars didn't follow him. He went back the next day and went exactly where he was and every one of those 12 cars, the people had died. And he was weeping and he was saying, it was like a, a line out of the film Schindler's List, if you've ever seen it. I could have saved more. I could have saved more. He was crying. And he said, a wise man told me to focus on the ones that followed me. And he stood there. And uh, all I could do was hug him. All I could do was hold him. I want to be real. I want you to know how personal this is. This is not just a news item. It's personal. Let's go to the next slide, please. 
Yeah. Let me just say this, just before I explain that, which is in our worship center on Mount Carmel, and you can see what it says already, um, that so the attack happened on the 7th of October. By the 14th, the following Saturday, Helen and the children, and I was persuaded to go with them, were on a British rescue flight to get us out, to get the children away from the rockets and the sirens. And the, it was unbelievable. So I went with them. And it was only when uh, we got on the flight, after we had had to lie on the floor because of sirens and a rocket attack, that I began to realize that a, a, a ministry engagement that had been arranged before the war, I could fulfill it. It was in Germany. I love Germany. That may sound strange coming from a Jew, but it's true. So I went with my family. I was there with them for a week in England. The first day we were just collapsing. We were so tired. We didn't realize how traumatized we were. And you don't often realize it until you get out. And so, yeah, got them out. And then I went off to Germany. And I said, Lord, what do you want me to do in Germany? I'm going. One of the things I was doing was an Israel conference in Nuremberg. Nuremberg. Remember Nuremberg? Hitler stood there and conducted his rallies in Nuremberg in the 1930s. And it's also the place at the end of the war where the Nuremberg trials of the Nazis were held. <coughs> And if someone can get me some water, I'd love a little bottle of water. Uh, I'm getting a bit croaky. It's your cold weather. <coughs> so when I was in Germany, what the Lord told me to do, he said, don't preach. Just share the reality. And the worst reality for the Germans. A thousand German Christians in Nuremberg. And we're doing an Israel conference. We're here the Lord said, but I went to the site where Hitler stood ranting or raving, and I stood there singing, Am Yisrael, Chai, the people of Israel live. Right where he stood. Because the Nazis had gone, and the Jew from Israel was standing there. Thank you so much. Thank you. See, Liverpool fans need water. <laughs> if you didn't know that, I'm a Liverpool fan, I never walk alone. <laughs> um, so I'm in Germany, in Nuremberg, with a thousand Christians who are loving Israel, praying for Israel. It's the first week of the war. I told the stories, and I told one story. I'm so sorry to tell you this story. Charlie Luke. Remember the party that was going on in the desert with all the young people? And Hamas came and killed, murdered, and raped, and slaughtered 240 of them. Those people that Sky News said, I have a mess. We have a Hamas spokesman today to tell you something. Really? You're listening to them? Are you crazy? 240 young people butchered. It was a, it was a rave. They didn't know any better. We're talking about 16 year olds and 17 and 18 and a few 20 year olds and even some. People with disabilities who were allowed to go, you know? They didn't know. The responsibility for their ungodly lives doesn't lie with them, it lies with us. The body in Israel, we're the holy remnant supposed to pray. You're the holy remnant in the UK supposed to be praying for your people. I told them about Charlie Luke, who was one of the young, a German Israeli woman. She was a pacifist. We do have them in Israel. People who say, I, I don't want to fight the army. You're a pacifist. God bless her. So she, they do community service instead. So she would have done this. So she was at the party. The terrorists captured her. They put her on the back of a truck. They stripped her naked. I'm trying not to look at your face while I tell this. They stripped her naked, hung her upside down, and paraded her through Gaza City. Remember that Israel hasn't gone in yet. Paraded her through Gaza City, holding, while children ran alongside getting sweets to celebrate. And the population was celebrating. And eventually, 
They butchered her, they beheaded her. German Israeli girl, pacifist, would never fight, completely shredded by her mass. We knew as a body in Israel, we knew we needed to do something. We couldn't just, I mean, of course we were praying. And we had regular once a month meetings of leaders, both Jewish and Arab pastors, leaders coming together, praying together. I spent the last two years crisscrossing the land because it's very easy to go to a meeting and just pray with people and sing a few songs and worship. It's another thing to have fellowship, to spend time, to listen, to, to give quality time to one another. So the Lord had me on this mission, which I'm still on, of going to different leaders, Arab and Jewish, and spending at least two hours hearing their burdens, understanding what's going on, and then I can feed it back to our congregation as well. But it's just to make the, the connection stronger. And for the last two to three years I've been doing that. Wonderful Arab pastors, wonderful people, wonderful Messianic Jewish believers like me as well, spending time together, eating falafel, telling, laughing with each other, crying with each other, praying with each other, having a relationship. We all need this. That's how the church grew. Having all things in common, broke bread together. Okay, so been doing that and then we there was a call we need to come together let's start let's pray and fast in fact it was the weekend before I came over so I came over last Saturday the weekend before Sunday Monday Tuesday three days of committed worship repentance remember repentance the first word Jesus ever said publicly repent repent You've been divided. You've been arguing about COVID. Remember that? No one's talking about COVID in Israel right now. I can tell you that. Uh, everyone having their own opinions. People not wanting to fellowship with each other. You know, pastors who were kind of avoiding each other. Enough is enough in the body of Christ. We're the holy remnant. You're the holy remnant. And so there was this call. And they said, we're... we're yeah, now building's the biggest. <laughs> so we can accommodate all the people. So we had this, what happened was the three days, that was amazing. Three days. And we have our own meetings in our congregation. So different congregations were doing their own meetings. And then we all came together in our building on that point. You can see one of the Jewish leaders holding his head. He's a pastor in Jerusalem. Others standing up. Do you know, that's an Arab prayer at the microphone, and uh, all around Jewish and Arab leaders, not just leaders, and some of the people came, they said, we, we need to be with you. And so the people came. We had a, an Arab Jewish worship night recently, and I listened to my Arab sisters groaning in the spirit as she sang beautifully. And I thought, boy, she sounds like me. Arabs and Jews who love Jesus, Yeshua, or in Arabic, Yasua, worshipping him in spirit and in truth, in unity, repenting, saying, Lord, what's happened is our failure. We have sinned. We have failed. We have not been praying as we should have been. We haven't been seeking you as we should have been. We haven't been hearing from you. We've been doing our own thing. And then suddenly this, this catas catastrophe comes. And we come together and it culminated on the fourth day like this. And I believe the Lord wants his body to do this around the world. In Isaiah it says, unless there had been left to us a small remnant, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, there's a lot of Sodom and Gomorrah going on in our world, is there not? Do we not have young people confused about even what their own sexuality is. And we have so much going on that's dreadful. And you're not going to get Rishi Sunak or any of the political leaders calling for a national day of prayer like was done during World War II. 
by the way. But surely the body can come together and say, look, you know, the, our nation's in a state, the politics is a mess, the world's in a mess, Israel is going through a catastrophe. Let's pray, let's worship, let's repent. It's Purim coming up in a couple of weeks, the feast of Esther. Have an Esther, Esther, by the way, you know, the Jew, young Jewish woman who's queen, and the whole Jewish nation is under threat of extermination. And she says, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to do this. And she does something very simple. You look at the scripture. I'm not going to tell you to tell you now. And she says, I and my maid servants will fast for three days. And then I'll go to the king. And if he doesn't want to listen, we're finished. But at least I'm going to do it. Who were the maid servants? They weren't Jewish. They were the Persian appointed um, women who were looking after the king's queens. That's an awkward thing to say. And they weren't Jewish. So it was Jews and Gentiles together fasting and praying for deliverance. And it came. It came. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, he will heal our land. He'll hear our prayers. But it's a unity. It's unity that is so desperately needed. Arabs and Jews together. If he can bring us together like this, it was the most, I said, Lot, I've said it a few times in different places, in the 15 years since Helen and I moved to Israel and have been serving there all this time, this was the most significant, important meeting I've ever been in. And I said not a word publicly, nor did most people. We just worshipped and repented, Jews and Arabs. If you can bring Jews and Arabs together, he must be able to bring different churches together. And then, finally, the last slide, please. That's my family. Because this is personal. They're an evacuated family. We don't know what the future is. It's the first time I've ever flown a few times. Like I went to Germany and I went to Cyprus, where I've only got one way because I don't know which way I'm going to return. Don't know how things are going to unfold. Um, that makes it much more expensive, by the way, apart from anything else. Um, and those are our beautiful adopted Jewish Arab children in one body, a symbol of our congregation. Let me just share one other thing with you. I leave that picture up. I think we'll leave that one up. Um, the other day I said I was appalled by something I saw on the BBC, the Blinkered Broadcasting Company. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, you know, when my parents, my Jewish parents, used to say to us as kids, you can always trust the BBC. In their day, yes. Back in the, wherever, I don't want to tell you how old I am. You know I'm about 30. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm always in denial, and denial is in Egypt. Think about that. Um, you can't trust the BBC. You cannot trust the Sky News. I watched Kay Burley interviewing the Israeli ambassador. I was appalled. That was in Israel I was watching that. She was so rude and ignorant. And then they had the Hamas representative and she was being so nice. But the other day the BBC did this. They said, right, we're going to um, hear from Israel now. And we've got this journalist, Gideon Levy. And um, he works for Haaretz newspaper. Now, if I say that, do you know who he is? Any of you know who he is? But you might be watching the news. And do you know what his beliefs are? Do you know whether he represents Israel or not? He's the most unrepresentative Israeli sponsor you could probably have. If somebody said, and now we're going to hear from Great Britain, and we're going to interview, I don't know, Jeremy Corbyn, that's the one. But some people uh, feel that he speaks for them, even though he's, I've met him, he's very anti Semitic. The head of the National Front, if it still exists, the fascists. He's going to share with you his view. 
Of course he's not representing Great Britain. Most people are certainly are not fascist. So why would you interview him? Well, why would you interview a far left extremist for the only extreme left wing newspaper in Israel? And I can tell you that the political left wing parties in Israel are not in parliament. We have, we have some extreme right who are awful, and Netanyahu, I'm going to say it so you can ask questions about it, is to blame for that. And we have extremists, and we have centrists, people in the middle, balanced, I would say, and they will need prayer, that's for sure. And we have centre-right people. And Gideon Levy said there are no politicians in Israel who could represent Israel. And yet he and his beliefs and his party don't get any seats in the parliament. How do they represent Israel? And the majority of the people have said that those people are mad. We're not even, we don't even want to hear from them. We need balanced and honest leadership. And BBC chose to interview him. He was the Israeli representative, as about as representative as the head of the National Front would be for speaking on behalf of Great Britain. That's how you are being manipulated by your news and media. And I sat there and Helen sat there and we were like, what? That's ridiculous. How could they do that? Why? Because the journalists believe the same thing. They have their political views and they manipulate you. And I'd say that, not to say there aren't valid questions you may have to ask. So now, I don't know if you want to come up or... or <laughs> all right. Um, we, we've got at least half an hour here. So questions, it's your turn. Uh, I'll try to answer. And if you want to use a microphone, maybe you should take the mic and come back out. Wolves all, all, fans uh, need exercise. <laughs> <laughs> so they actually won today, didn't they? Some miracles do happen. <laughs> Feel free. And I mean, if you've got difficult questions, you want to challenge something I said, feel free to do so. I really mean that with every part of me. You're seeing things on the news. I know what you're seeing. Just raise your hand. Feel free. Yes. Colin, welcome. Yes. Welcome. Thank you for that. In the light of what's happening in this country, with all the demonstrations, how does the credibility of the people of this nation stand up in Israel? What do they think of us? Well, that's a great question. Thank you. Britain has a history, of course. It had the mandate. It was, before Israel became independent in 1948, it was the British who was controlling the land and they couldn't handle it. And so they wanted to give it back to the United Nations to vote on a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Jewish state was Israel and the Arab state was Jordan. They weren't talking about Palestinian state when they voted in Flushing Meadows, New York in November 1947. And Israel was offered 22% uh, of the land that was in the original plan. 22%. And said, yes, we'll take it. And the Arab nations all refused it and, and uh, started warring against it from its very birth, inception, back in May 1948. So this is nothing new with Britain. And what in the historic sense, Jewish people remember good British people who were helping and good British soldiers and also the bad ones who gave all their arms to the uh, Arabs before they left. So there's a mixed bag of history there. Everybody's aware of what is happening in London every weekend. It's in Israeli news. And when they plaster from the river to the sea, on Big Ben, they don't even, some of those people in those marches, of course, don't even know what, what river they're talking about and what sea they're talking about. But what they're actually saying is, from the river to the sea is basically going back to 1947 
and 48, and saying Israel has no right to exist. Therefore, Palestine will be free, is what they're saying, from the river, the Jordan River, which borders in places Israel and Jordan, two-state solution, Israel-Jordan. And the sea, of course, is the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Helen and the children, and myself, live quite close to the Mediterranean Sea, about 20 minutes drive. And what they're actually saying is, we want to commit genocide. From the river to the sea, no Jews. Mahmoud Abbas, by the way, who posted on the internet and then took down his post, said that October the 7th was done by the Jews to the Jews. He's supposed to be the moderate, by the way. Um, from the river to the sea means no Jewish state. And they're plastering it on Big Ben. And then the Met police say, oh no, it's not really anti-Semitic. Come on. They want to butcher us. If you have Muslim friends, and I, I, I want you to be praying for any Muslim you know, that they come to the Lord, because they're amazing. And, um, but if you know the Muslims, you can ask them one question, and it will be, I suspect, something I thought about recently, very revealing. You can just ask them very simply, do you accept that Israel has a right to exist? See what their answers are. Just have a listen. I mean, if they don't want to answer it, that might be revealing too. How could you, you know, do you accept that Ireland has a right to exist, even after England beat them at rugby today? Do you accept that Ireland has a right to exist? You're not going to hesitate about that, are you? No, of course Ireland has a right to exist. We need Guinness occasionally. Um, I'm joking, and please forgive me if you're Irish. Um, but the point is, does Israel have a right to exist? Well, the United Nations says so. Every Western democratic country says so. Israel is the only democratic country in the Middle East, which is why we get, had so many African refugees coming to us, because they felt safer in Israel than they did in our neighbors' countries. In fact, they would receive them in places like Jordan or Saudi Arabia, but they came flooding through Egypt, from Sudan and Eritrea and Ethiopia into Israel in the early 2000s, and some of them became my spiritual sons and daughters. So, the point I'm making is, just ask the Muslim, does Israel have a right to exist? If they don't immediately say, well, of course. That should be very revealing. So we see what's happening in Britain. Jewish people, I've got Jewish family living in England, who are terrified. I remember my, they were terrified before when Corbyn was the leader of the Labour Party and they were worried if he got in, what would happen? Because Corbyn had said the first thing he would do if he became Prime Minister was recognise the free state of Palestine. And they had a Labour Party conference, let me remind you, waving Palestinian flags when he made the speech. And my niece, sorry, my nephew's wife, Jo, she's a secular Jew, she's not religious at all. We all got together as a family, we're having a meal. Corbyn's the leader of the Labour Party at the time. And she said, Unk, Unk, they call me Unk. We're scared. I said, what do you mean you're scared? What are you talking about? If Corbyn gets in, we have to leave. I'm thinking, Great Britain. This is Great Britain we're talking about. This isn't Putin's Russia. This is Great Britain. We're scared. If he gets in, we'll have to leave. We'll come. We'll leave. We'll get out. We'll come to Israel. I was in shock that she said that. And then Corbyn didn't get in. So you have going to have Mr. Starmer as your next Prime Minister. I'm sure of it. Looks like it, doesn't it? But what happens after he's been in power for about a year and the popularity goes down and the Labour Party people say, well, maybe we need to change our leader. We'll get a Corbynista in, shall we? I mean, Angela Reno or 
you know, all the left wingers that are not being mentioned as anti-Semitic, like Richard Burgon, MP, who is hugely anti-Semitic and hates Israel, and a whole batch of other Labour MPs, no, no, the constituency parties, and I'm not telling you to vote Conservative, I'm just giving you reality. What's to stop there being a coup in the Labour Party after Starmer's been Prime Minister for a year and they elect someone and say, right, well, let's get Galloway back into the party, let's get Corbyn back into the party, and let's have somebody who really represents the hard left. And how are the Jewish people going to respond to that? And then they see from the river to the sea on Big Ben, and they know it means genocide. They go home and that's what God wants. Well, God can use it. But that doesn't excuse it. No. That's the truth. Someone else? Thanks for that question. Got me going. <laughs> Come on, feel free. And you can ask difficult questions. I don't mind. I know love lots of you kind of I'm preaching to the converted, but you know, feel free. But likewise, it's not just happening in England, it is it? No. no it's, it's a worldwide problem. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting that the Germans that I had an affiliation with, and they were always inviting me to come, it's amazing. Um, they immediately understood what happened on October the 7th. They said, we know this. This is, our, this is the same spirit. It's the Nazis. They are Nazis. And we have the shame of our own history to know exactly what this is all about. They understood it. I don't I mean, I, I can see some people who understand it, but I, I don't get the same feeling as I get in Germany. Uh, in Egypt, right next door to Gaza. Yes. And they are fellow Muslim brothers. Yes. You know, I mean, Israel's surrounded by Islamic countries, the brothers yes. and sisters. <laughs> we pray for them. Why don't they let the Gazans in? Why do you think? Well, why don't they? Well, why do you think? They've got the Jews in books. They don't want them. They don't want them. They don't want them. That's how much luck they've got for them. They haven't carved out a field somewhere in the Sinai Desert uh, where, where people who are in Rafa. You know, Israel's under a lot of pressure not to go to Rafa because so many um, of the Arab people living in Gaza evacuated into tents living by that Egyptian border um, in the city of Rafa. And Israel is busy trying to work out, well, we'll, we'll evacuate them then. We've got to get rid of those tunnels. They've destroyed literally hundreds of kilometers long tunnels that cost millions to build while the people in Gaza were starving. And Hamas is stealing the aid. I don't know if you saw a clip a few weeks ago of an elderly Arab woman in Gaza City who was being interviewed by Al Jazeera, hardly friends of Israel. And they said, oh, so are you getting enough aid? And this woman said, I don't care anymore. I don't care anymore about um, not telling you what I'm about to say. Hamas is stealing our aid. She was brave. She said, I've lived long enough. They want to kill me, they can kill me. They're stealing it. And um, so anyway, you, a few weeks ago, Israel rescued two hostages. Two men, one was 60, one was 70. Their families had given up all hope. They were in Rafa. So what did Israel do? Did they go in there and bomb the living daylights out of them? No, they didn't. They had intelligence that said there were two hostages being guarded by terrorists, armed terrorists. They went in at three o'clock in the morning when everyone, most people were asleep, so you avoid civilian casualties. They went in at three o'clock in the morning, got in, killed the terrorists, rescued the two guys, got out, nobody got hurt other than the terrorists. Of course they have to go in. If they didn't go to Rafa, those two men would still be hostages. Hi, Colin. Uh, Hi. I've got a few friends in, in Israel, and I was there uh, two months before the attack on uh, the 7th. Yep. 
uh, preached the gospel for the family of the south and north of Israel. And it was a bit hard for them to accept it as uh, Jesus and the concept of that religion. But since the attack, they won't accept anything now, really. They're saving. So, what would be the spiritual life of Israel post Satan uh, of Tolbert? Will Israel be together as a nation, believing in God of Israel? Or are they so secular, most of it? It's the most population of Israel is like, who cares, or, you know, if there's a God knows it or not, or are they stronger? I do believe that it becomes stronger since the secular. Yeah. But I just want to see your view on yeah. that. First of all, the body of believers is growing. Arab and Jewish people are getting saved. That's for sure. Nothing has stopped on that because of what happened. If anything, more and more are looking. Um, it's a very secular country with a very strong religious minority. And um, the religious ones, don't, many of them don't fight. And that creates uh, a tension between the secular Israelis and the Orthodox Jews who say, oh no, you know, don't want to enter the army. Um, of course the country is, is devastated. People are, there's no one who hasn't been affected. I mean, our congregation has been affected in so many ways. I mean, we, we have busloads of people going down <laughs> south to help the farmers pick the fruit, otherwise uh, it would, wouldn't come in. That's the first thing, because all the workers who are working in the field are now in the army. Um, that's one thing. The country is united in the military war against Hamas. It had enough, as I explained, not just since October the 7th, but for nearly 20 years before. It's enough already, and Hamas has to be at least demilitarized. I don't know if you can kill every terrorist, but you can demilitarize it so that they will not fire rockets anymore, so that the people living in the South can go home and be, have some degree of peace, some degree. Um, but with the government, everyone is furious. And as soon as elections are held, the current government is out. And I think you'll see the end of Netanyahu's career. And he's spoiled his legacy in recent years by increasingly trying to maintain power by encouraging extreme right-wingers <coughs> like <coughs> Mr. Ben Gavir and Betzal Smodrich, to name them two. Um, he encouraged them to amalgamate so they would get enough votes to be in the parliament and that would bolster his building of a coalition government. So we have extremists. Now let me tell you how extreme they are. They believe the only good Arab is a dead Arab. Now you tell me, I'm a pastor of a congregation with other leaders, of Jews and Arabs together. How could I look my Arab brother or sister in the eye and say I voted for Benjamin Netanyahu? And we're a one new man congregation of Jews and Arabs who love Jesus together. And that's more important than anything. And I am, you know, and I, yeah, the, the nation knows but Netanyahu ultimately is to blame for the failure of not listening to primarily women soldiers who were monitoring the activities on the border before the 7th of October and were warning their commanders, something is brewing here, You've got to, we've got to strengthen our defenses. They were ignored. In one instance, a female soldier was even told, if you keep talking about it, we'll discipline you by her male commander. So misogyny was very much a part of this as well. And then when it happened, and I have to tell you, it, it's, it's another holocaust. There's no other way to describe it. I was asked by those 70 pastors over, some of them were asking me as we walked around kibbutz near us, how are you feeling? And I said, the only Jewish person here, the only Jewish believer here. How are you feeling? I said, this reminds me of my visit to Auschwitz back in, when Helen and I visited Auschwitz back in 2014. That bad. There's no words. It's unspeakable. I'm trying to speak the unspeakable. Um, so of course we're wounded even more as a nation as a result of it. And yes, there are people who are angry and, and want revenge and... Um, 
And so we're united with the military and we wait for the government to be replaced. And Benjamin Netanyahu not once has taken any responsibility at all. He's just trying to blame everybody else. It's very sad. We're not rejoicing. By the way, there's no winners here. We lost too many people already. We lost over 250 soldiers. And yes, the Hamas Health Authority, do you really trust them? Claim that 30,000 Gazans have died. They don't tell you how many of them were terrorists. <laughs> Somebody said most of them. But we don't know. But the thing is, yeah, we weep. For every innocent child, mother in Gaza, we weep. But let me just say it like this. The responsibility lies with Hamas. As much as the murder of people in World War II lie, lie with the Nazis. Given what you just said about Netanyahu, um, do you think he has the wherewithal to press this home completely and um, see it completely put down? Is that even possible? And what do you think the reaction in the north will be if he does that? Well, of course, we, we live close to the north. There is a, you know, people think, oh, well, nothing much is happening in the north. That's not true. There have been rockets fired at all the northern communities. We live more in land. They haven't quite, we've had a couple, but nothing too dreadful. At least it would be dreadful for our kids. That's the thing. Um, Next thing I need to go, the sooner the better. There are plenty of, I mean, Benny Gantz, who's in, has been in England, just, I don't know if he's still here, but he was certainly here, and was in America before. He's the leader of the opposition. He's the leader of what is called the National Unity Party. Heather Knight, you met him. He's a good guy. He tells the truth. We'd like a leader who tells us the truth. So he would be a good guy to lead the, the country sooner rather than later. Can you get rid of every terrorist? I don't think so. You've got generations of hatred. They're taught this in the mosques, in the schools. Hate Jews, murder Jews, kill Jews. We have Arabs in our community who will tell us what they were taught. And um, one man, Maroon, in our worship band, he's our drummer. And he's a lovely guy. And I said to him, how are you feeling? Are you okay with everything that's going on? He's an Arab. He said, yeah, he said, something good can come out of this. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, at last, there's no denying for Christian, sorry, Arab Muslims and Arab Christians to know the truth of the wickedness and the evil of Islam, radical Islam, what they did, and maybe then, now they will change their thinking and their understanding of Israel and of the people. I thought that was an incredible statement from an Arab to say that. So there's hope. In, you know, we don't lose hope. And there are good things. But it's terrible. I, I can just tell you one other thing. I have a very good Christian Arab woman friend. Uh, she's a friend of the family. I'll say her first name because some of you may have encountered her. Her name's Christy. Originally from Bethlehem. She was living there and then Israel erected the security barrier which went to prevent suicide bombing in the early 2000s in Israel. They erected the security barrier. And Christy and her family, Arab Christian, were living right by the barrier. And um, Christy, who was trained in law and loves the Lord so much, stood up and publicly said, it's good news, we're glad because it will stop Arabs killing themselves. She's an Arab. And uh, then they put a fatwa on her because she went public. They wanted to kill her. And I'm talking about Abbas and the Fatah movement, let alone Hamas. Plenty of Hamas there as well, by the way, in that area. And um, so she had to flee and she came to London for nine years until they lifted the fatwa, but she could only come and go because there are still people that would like to kill her. And just to let you know, just to give you a, I mean, she's amazing. And uh, she doesn't argue for any two-state solutions, just a one-state. But 
Um, uh, she's amazing. I'm actually having tea and scones with her. Because she's in London up there. So next Tuesday, in central London, <coughs> the so-called no-go area, there's no no-go areas. We've got to make sure, we're in the kingdom of God people, we can go anywhere. Come on, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're meeting, I'm going to tell you where we're meeting, but I'm not telling you the time. <laughs> we're meeting at Green Park Underground Station, and then we're going to go have tea and scones together. Jew and Arab. who love Jesus and love each other. And in loving the Lord, that's a, the only peace process I believe that will work for the Middle East. Could I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, you criticized Mr. Biden during your speech. Yeah, well, well, yes. If I, I remember carefully, he was one of the strongest supporters of the Israeli Prime Minister during the war. At so the beginning. Why, why now? Because he has seen, in my opinion, the wrong, if you like to put it like that, that this war is carrying on would do. And he's speaking against it. So why do you say he has Richardson at his anti Israel? Okay, thank you. And I agree with you. At the beginning of the war, he refused any calls for a ceasefire exactly. at the beginning of the war and said Israel has a right to go after Hamas. The problem for Mr. Biden is he's got an election coming up in November against yeah. that guy with strange hair, blonde hair. And I, you know, I think it's very dangerous for Christian people, believers in the Lord, to identify with one political party or another because sooner or later they will do or say something that compromises your own faith. So if, for instance, the Democratic Party in America, Biden's party, is pro-abortion, um, I hate to say that they, have, they were the ones who introduced trans toilets in America, the Democrats. Uh, things that compromise your Christian faith. You would not go with those things. Biden called for a, uh, refused the call for a ceasefire at the beginning, but he's got an election coming, and he's got a lot of extreme left-wing haters of Israel in the Democratic Party, and they also want to win the Muslim vote in America in November. Trump's in the lead in the polls, I'm no fan of Mr. Trump, so I want you to hear me strongly. He did some things that were good for Israel. He also said some things that were basically anti-Semitic. He did. Trump, I'm talking about. Now, Biden, he said that Jews should be grateful and they should all vote for me. That's not right. You don't say things like that. That was Mr. Trump. Um, Mr. Biden, suddenly said, yes, there must be a ceasefire, and Israel must put more aid in. They've got to do more, even though they're being shot at when they do it. They've got to do more. And putting all the pressure on Israel, and maybe just as an afterthought, he then says, and he said it just the other day, he said, and Hamas must release all the hostages and ceasefire. But they're not releasing the hostages, and they're not ceasing fire and they want to commit the atrocities that I've shown you on the PowerPoint again and again and again. They've said it. So the Hezbollah in Lebanon, they want to do the same. What is Israel supposed to do with that? But Just ignore like, it? It's Just like, leave it? It's like saying, if I kill, some, kill a, a person in here, yes. you should go out there and kill every black person that walks across the road. That's, that's how that looks to me. My dear sister, I really appreciate your heart. I got saved in a predominantly black Pentecostal church in East in I mean, No, no, no but listen to me. me. No, no, you listen to me. It doesn't bear comparison. It's not, no. It's not I the same that, kind of racism. Not because of race. Mm. Because I have lots of white. Okay. I have lived in this country for over 70 years. Yeah. So, 
I, have, I am not speaking, I don't speak of that metaphorically because each time we say Hamas, let's kill one person, his role, or Mr. the Prime Minister, killed a whole lot of sick of people. Well, how can that be fair? Israel hasn't killed anybody in a hospital, actually. That was proven to be a lie. That's not true. Well, you were telling me it's a lie. But what no, is? even the United Nations, even Al Jazeera, the Arab media outlet. Israel was accused of bombing the Shifa hospital in Gaza during the war. And the BBC, with Jeremy Bowen, who's very anti-Israel, jumped and said, yes, it's Israel that did it. They bombed the hospital and... Hamas said 500 people died in that hospital. And then Sky News, oh yes, they did. It, they rushed to judgment. And then it was Al Jazeera, of all people, who had news footage of the, of the missile that was fired by Islamic Jihad that misfired. And they showed the film and it landed right on the in front of the hospital and killed 50 people, not 500, they were exaggerating. But it was terrible, but it wasn't Israel. It was the terrorists having their misfired rockets who killed those people in the hospital. So, and that is proven by, and America has accepted it, the UK has accepted it, the evidence is clear, it's on film, it's recorded. Please don't say it, it simply isn't true. And also, let me just say this. Israel isn't trying to kill a hundred people for one person. They're trying to remove Hamas, who've been butchering our people and firing rockets for 17 years. Do you have children? Do you have grandchildren? You love them? That's exactly my point. Yeah. So if somebody fires a rocket at your children while they're playing in your back garden, what would you expect the government to do? Just, oh well, leave it. No. We don't want to hurt those people. No, there would be a law against that. But they're lawless. I think you have to think about it. That's what I want to say. And by the way, my first spiritual father in the New Testament Church of God in Clapton, Hackney, East London, Reverend Ira Vivian Brooks, a Jamaican, who used to call me, he used to call me Colin, not Colin. <laughs> and, and, and he passed at me, now listen, let me finish. I want to I pay tribute to him. It's in my book, by the way. He passed at me, he understood as a Christian pastor who loved God, loved Jesus, that you cannot love God and not love Israel and the Jewish people. Amen. Amen. Well, you cannot love Jesus and not love the world. Correct, and I've said that very clearly. But that doesn't mean you allow people to butcher your children and your grandchildren without defending them Next and without Let's removing them. Different topic completely. Please. Day to day life in Israel. Are schools open now? Can some people go to work? Um, Good question. How's, how's the tourism going? Because you've had COVID and now all of that is closed. Um, how is the food getting into the shops? And Okay. What does the future look like? Well, it's uncertain, is the word. The future is uncertain. There are, in all the areas where war is going on, so in, all around the south and on the northern borders, no schools. That was one of the reasons we evacuated the children in the first place, because their schools were closed straight away. And so we evacuated them. Then their schools reopened, and quieter in our neighborhood. So they, you know, went back, came back for a while, but then the northern border started heating up. Let me say something about the north. It's very hard to imagine. So I'm a big football fan. Wembley Stadium. How many people is it hold? Don't you? Don't you? Know? Okay. So fill the stadium with eighty thousand people, right? Imagine eighty thousand people who are Jewish people, Israelis, but also Arabs too, living on the northern borders with Lebanon where Hezbollah, who also funded and armed by Iran, Iran is funded and armed by Russia, by Putin, um, 
80,000 people have been evacuated from their northern border homes and they're currently, with children of course, living in hotels and anywhere else they can find in the centre of the land. And they want to go home, but they can't go home because it isn't safe. Do so Israel evacuated. Do they have to pay for the hotels? No, they don't pay for the hotels. But of course they're not home. <coughs> and the kids get some schooling sometimes. <coughs> Teachers going into the hotels, sit with the children, try and give them some. I've been in some of those hotels, see the kids running around the hotels. Um, the land, so there is a lot of devastation. Um, and we cry out for the people of Gaza, and we pray for them, and we pray for the people of Lebanon, and we pray for all our Arab neighbours. And our biggest prayer is, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done, as in, as in heaven and on earth, over Israel, over Lebanon, over Gaza, over Jordan, over Saudi Arabia, over Iraq, over Iran. Iran is very involved in this war, mm -hmm. yes. and, uh, and Putin helps Iran. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, life is disrupted, well, that's but our well, people are very resilient. Well, that's yeah. one for me. <laughs> that's one, that's one for me. Yeah. It's two states solution that they're talking about. Yeah. Israel's the one state. Who's the other? Well, back in 1947, two-state solution that the politicians like to bang me about. That's the only way Israel will have peace. That is nonsense. You need to read the charter of Hamas. You need to see what the radical Islamists believe. And they say, they say that their whole policy is the total destruction of the Jewish people. A la Hitler. It's exactly the same. It's the same spirit. It's the same hatred. And you cannot... How do you negotiate peace with someone who doesn't acknowledge your right to exist? That's why I one in this video. I said, if you have Muslim friends, just ask them. Does Israel have a right to exist and see what kind of response you get? It would be very interesting, very revealing. How does the Israeli uh, public respond to the Prime Minister trying to... Uh, get normalised relationships with other Arab states? Well, it's kind of on hold at the moment. Everything's on hold. Because we're dealing with war. We're dealing with an existential threat to our nation, to our people, to our children, to their future. So, of course, there isn't... I mean, there are... I don't think the people of Israel are against peace. In fact, the opposite is true. They long for peace. But that doesn't mean we're just going to allow people to butcher us. That's the issue. You're either a pacifist who believes that, okay, we'll just pray and trust God to protect us, or we'll pray and ask God to enable us to protect ourselves. And that's, that's part of that conversation we were having, sister, as well. That Israel has a right to defend itself. And we're not defending against people who, oh well, we'll listen to the law then. Yes, you're right, I shouldn't be doing this anymore. They are obsessed with our destruction. They will not negotiate their beliefs and say, okay, we'll let you exist. They're not that way inclined, sadly. And the only thing that can change people like that is prayer, is Jesus himself. And I, I, mean, I was having an amazing phone conversation very recently with an ex-Hezbollah terrorist who got saved, came to faith, and he and I, like brothers, talking on the phone. Why? That's the hope. That's the only way. He is the way. And it's painful. I mean, take no pleasure in this. And, you know, we have a young family in our congregation, actually originally from Ukraine, and their son's in the army. He was in Gaza. Lovely, believing family. People I love, people I pray for. And uh, he was with his unit in Gaza. And they went into a building to check it out. They were checking out what they thought, but well, it was an empty building. Except it was booby-trapped. And a bomb went off. 
Immediately, one member of the unit died, was killed outright. Our young man was the nearest one to the explosion, was completely thrown, knocked unconscious, had uh, smoke poisoning, shrapnel in his body, was put in, uh, when he got to hospital, they put him straight into a coma, a reduced coma, and he survived. He's uh, completely restored to health after the surgery. He's back in his unit. Praise the Lord. But all for me at the time was, Lord, please, we, how can we, you know, losing just one son in our congregation, it's like you lost a member of your family and it's an unbearable thought which agonizes us every day because we've got several people serving in different capacities, men and women. And at the same time, because we're so close to it, there is no desire. I mean, I read those verses that our Lord said, love your enemies. Well, you can't love your enemy, at least unless you pray for them. That's the beginning, that you pray for your enemies. And we pray that Hamas terrorists and Hezbollah terrorists bent on total murder, rape, slaughter, murdering babies, would be saved. Amen. We do pray for them. This is not a hate message. This is a love message. But it's also a message which says, understand what's happening on the ground because we have to defend ourselves. I do not want my children butchered by Hamas or Hezbollah. And I will, over my dead body, they'll be butchered. And I mean it. I know. Just a quick one. Um, we do have some ladies from Iran in our church. Sorry? We have some ladies from Iran yes. in our church. Yes. And I was talking to them and they said they learn in school from a very young age. In Iran? Iran, yes. They escape Iran because one of them became Christian, yes. the other one came to study here. But they learn in a very young age Death to Jewish and death to Americans. Yes. In their native yes. school. Um, just um, talking about Great Britain now. Um, I work in Birmingham City Centre, and yes. since it started, there are lots of um, manifests with the protests. Yes. Loads and loads and hundreds. Every other week we have, and I see loads of Palestinians. And the, the Birmingham Council put the colors in the fountain that has some lights with the Palestinian flag there. I have the Star of David. I wear it as a, as a, as a necklace. And I, and I don't feel safe sometimes. And uh, how, you, as, as a Jewish, how do you think, how safe is Great Britain to a Jewish person? And what can we do for them to feel safe here? Because I believe that those Palestinian people that I've seen in, in Birmingham wearing Palestinian lives matter, yes. you know, yeah. and from the river to the sea, uh, load everybody having it every other week, uh, they probably feel safe to do it here. I don't see any Israeli people doing anything. But how, what can we do to make it safe to do this Just one, way? okay, thank you. First of all, there are Israeli people doing, Jewish people doing things, but they're having to do it mostly on Sundays. And there have been marches in London of Jewish and pro-Israel people, Christians primarily, on Sundays with police protection, advance notice, and obviously, um, very quiet and very peaceful. That's what they do. They have been, but a lot less than the, I could have to call them what they are, hate marches that happen in London and elsewhere for that matter. Um, I don't know if you know, because I love football, there's really soccer players playing for Glasgow Celtic has just had to leave because at the Celtic games they're just flying Palestinian flags and they were abusing him, their own flag. He couldn't, he, although his, the players and the manager were supportive, he said, I can't stay here. 
I can't, it's too, it's too dangerous. And it is dangerous, right? I, I have to say as a Jew who came to faith over 44 years ago in London in the East End, that I feel much more safe, it's going to sound strange, I feel safer in Israel than I ever do in the UK, even in the current climate. Even in the current climate. What can you do if you know Jewish people, whether they're secular or whatever? You can just say to them, hey, we're praying for you, we're praying for your peace, we're praying for your security, we love you guys. We don't have a Bible without the Jewish people who wrote both the New and Old Testament. We don't have a Jesus who's Jewish apart from everything else. We don't have our own saviour. We don't have the word of God. So we love you guys and we're praying for you and we're praying for everybody affected, which includes Arab people. It's not, it's not an exclusive prayer. But the, the world of politics and the world of protest, especially here, is horrific. And it's, of course, the Jewish people in England are afraid. They go to synagogues and they have cameras outside watching. They have security guards. Do you have security guards in church? No. I've done a few meetings actually in Europe um, where they were promoted online and because of where I'm coming from, they had security. Um, and that's something that is uncomfortable, makes me feel uncomfortable. But, yeah, just showing love to people. And by the way, showing love to Muslim people. Muslim people are hurting. I don't doubt it for one moment. And they may not know the truth, and they may they read. Most of their media is Islamic media. And they are told all kinds of things. So many conspiracies. 9-11 was done by Israel, according to the Islamic media. I'm serious. I've spoken to Muslims I, about that. And I said, where did you get that from? Oh, well, we read our own press. Oh, Israel did it October the 7th. They did it to themselves. So how do you deal with that? So you prayer, deliverance, friendship, love. If the church doesn't reach out to the Islamic communities with the gospel and with love in practical ways, this country will be a Muslim majority country very, very quickly. And that's not spreading fear. It's just the truth. One final question. Yeah. Well, I don't know whether mine's a question or whether to say, brother, everything you have said here tonight is true. Absolutely true. And you've always got to remember our Jesus is a Jew. And if we worship our Jesus, he's a Jew, what are you going to do? Our Jewish brothers belong to us. They belong to us. So where do we stand? Why are we going on about this? I was horrified when I saw October the 7th. As a matter of fact, if I'd have arrived and not a Christian, I would have shot a lot of the heinous at what they were doing to those women. Remember what they do to those women, that if Israel doesn't fight for that right, it will happen in every nation and no woman will be safe. Not one, because we all have the same done to us. So it's best now to stand up and be counted. Remember our Lord Jesus is coming back. But let's find faith to love each other. Yes, to love our enemy. But at the end of the day, God is the answer. He's doing miracles in Israel. He's, he's caused, he's even flooding some of those underground tunnels with the rain. But he's also saved, he's also saved, thinking he's Philistines, he's saved many people who even shot people. He's saving. But let's face it, we can't stand on one side or the other. We are who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we stand for Israel. Every part of it. And we love you all. Thank you, sister. Um, look, it's not easy talking about this. It's it's beyond painful. And I, I mean, I did say, how can anyone burn babies and kill them? And that would apply whether they're burning Jewish babies 
or Arabic. Either way. The only difference is Hamas purposefully did it. Israel is trying everything to avoid it. If you don't believe me, there's a, a well-known British General Colonel Richard Kemp who has presented evidence at the United Nations that Israel's army is actually the most moral army in the world and goes, of course there are bad apples there, but goes out of its way to avoid civilian casualties, sending warnings, warnings and phone messages, leafleting areas saying we're going to do this in order for innocent people to come out of the way wherever possible. I want to read, I'm just going to declare this over us. Um, and we all know the Lord's Prayer. We kind of say it repetitiously without understanding the depth of it. And I want to say it, and I'll add a little depth as I declare it. Avino, that's our Abba, our Father, the one who we should be coming to, the one who holds us in his everlasting arms, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name, your name is holy. We declare your name, Yeshua, Jesus, Yahshua, over Israel, over Lebanon, over Gaza, over Egypt, over Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Iraq, Iran, Syria. Lord, over the Middle East, we declare your holy name and we cry out, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We cry out, Lord, to give us this day our daily bread and help us to be the answers of, to people's prayers who are suffering that we can share some of that daily bread with people in need. Forgive us our sins. Lord, help us to repent. Help us to repent as we forgive those who sin against us. And Lord, do not lead us into temptation. Lord, help us not to choose to be tempted, but deliver us from the evil one. Lord, I pray for deliverance for the people of Gaza. Lord, would you deliver them from Hamas? Would you deliver the Lebanese people from Hezbollah? Would you deliver the Iranian people from the Ayatollahs? And thank you, Lord, that in spite of all of that, you're saving people in Gaza, in Iran, in Lebanon, and it's amazing. So deliver us from the evil one. And we declare all of this. Why? Because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hashem, Yeshua, Hamashiach, in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. tonight thank you very much god bless you um yeah there's, there's a lot of thoughts going around my mind at the moment but um you know a couple of the things that, that, that i love about colin is his love for humanity and you see that you know it's not about yes he's jewish but the fact that he can stand side by side with an arab brother you know, and to worship the Lord together because that's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus does. And that gives us hope. And we would say that He is the only hope. It is not a two state solution or a three state solution or whatever. Jesus is the hope. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Um, Our vision is to be a worshipping community at the heart of Kings Winford. Where every home is an expression of the Kingdom. And every believer a disciple of the King. Our mission is to be obedient to the Great Commission. Through the faithful proclamation of the Gospel. And developing, equipping and sending of disciples.
Welcome to King's Wingford Christian Centre.